I'm uh, delighted to be joined by Dr. Ashley Frawley, Senior Lecturer in Sociology and Social Policy at Swansea University. Uh, very good afternoon to you, Doctor. In your view, does nudge work? Um, in some cases, yes. Um, in, uh, just as your previous guest was saying, in many cases it's fairly innocuous. But the issue is, well, what does it mean for something to work? I mean, we are assuming that those in power and those doing the nudging have actually understand the issue, have actually understood the issues, and um, that they know what the solutions are. And therefore, all that needs to be done is just to get people to act correctly, and everything will be fine. Um, and I think that's part of the issue. It's not only that nudge, um, you know is a path to coercion. It absolutely is. But when you take that, um, those nudges out of debate, you take out of debate the fact that actually policymakers might have their understanding of the issue entirely wrong. If policymakers have decided that the rational thing to do, and you've written about rationality in this context, that the rational thing to do is X, whether it's jabs, masks or social distancing or what have you, if they really believe that, should they not make it a rule, a law, rather than saying, well, you might find this useful? We definitely think it's useful. It's now up to you. Well, they will end up doing that eventually. This is the thing, is that they're so... They're so um, convinced by their own understanding of the issue. They can't imagine that they could be wrong. So when the nudges fail, they don't imagine like, oh, well, maybe we've misunderstood here. Maybe we should rethink the issue. They think, ah, oh, yes, people really are weak. We actually can't trust the nudges. So that's why the nudges become pushes, become shoves over time. They just keep convincing themselves they can't possibly be wrong. It must be the public that's wrong. It must be the public that is fundamentally weak. And therefore, they must be pushed. There, there must be a law. I don't actually think that's necessarily better. I mean, at least with a law, you know where you stand and you can have a little bit of a debate about that. But I don't want to live in a society where we have laws against social gatherings. Like, I don't think that's the right path to go. Yes, it's clear, um, at least in an authoritarian society that's outright authoritarian, you know that you live in that kind of world. But do we want that kind of world for, for the benefit of clarity? Yeah. But the, uh, you, you come exactly to the nub of the problem. If if government advised by SAGE and other uh, bodies of people who are supposed to have done the science, are supposed to understand it, have their own debate and then recommend to ministers, um, as Jenny Harris did over parties uh, uh, and what have you, and they say this is a matter of life and death, government in that context has to make a call and it strikes me that just giving a nudge one way or the other is a cop-out. Possibly, um, but I think actually people are able to judge risks fairly well. I mean, if you look at um, surveys, if you look at you know people's attitude toward vaccination, it pretty well accords with the benefit that they actually get from vaccination. I think people are aware now. I mean, I, I can understand if very early on, in the pandemic where we didn't really know where we stood, that you might need to do these kinds of heavy handed things. But I think people have had two years now, people have a pretty good grasp of things and they're able to make choices, informed choices for themselves. I think having that choice there is really, really important and taking it away risks affirming um, that actually we can't be trusted with something like democracy. Actually, we can't be trusted with making free choices. And I think that's an even more dangerous path to tread. I know, you know, you can take all these things away when you say it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of life and death. Don't think, don't think. But actually, we do need to think. What are the long-term effects of allowing this slippery slope from nudges to pushes to shoves? How fascinating. Let me conclude then with this question. So it's not guidance. It's not nudge. It's not the choice of uh, legislation or a in reality, what you're saying is this is about leadership. If government thinks that something is the appropriate course of action for society at large, then if there's strong leadership at the top, folk will follow a rational decision. If there's weak leadership, they'll just go do their own thing at whatever price. Yes, but of course, leadership is not something that just plows through what the public thinks, right? These people, I, I've seen this a few times where, and it's quite disturbing, where they say, you know, leaders have to have the courage to stand against the masses. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were our representatives. You're not supposed to stand against us. When I elect you, I don't give up all of my decision-making power. I don't give everything up. We, we're supposed to, you're supposed to lead us, but not plow over us. I mean, I think that's the scary thing. Yes, we do need strong leadership, but it needs to be listening to people and a voice of the people, not over the people.
Ashley Frawley, greatly enjoyed that conversation as well. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this Saturday afternoon. That's Dr. Ashley uh, Frawley, Senior Lecturer in Sociology and Social Policy at Swansea University. So great start to the conversation. Laura Dodsworth saying uh, broadcasters certainly shouldn't get involved uh, with government nudge units. I agree with that. Free will is good, but so too is responsible government. It's a balance between the two. And nudge can be effective, but it's a precarious policy if it's in the wrong hands. And actually, you just heard they're saying government uh, needs to lead us, yes, but they also to remember need to remember that they are supposed to represent us and do what we want them to do as well. 